the scholar gypsy. Go, for they call you shepherd from the hill. Go, shepherd, and untie the wattled coats. No longer leave thy wistful flock unfed, nor let thy bawling fellows rack their throats, nor the cropped grasses shoot another head. But when the fields are still and the tired men and dogs all gone to rest, and only the white sheep are sometimes seen, cross and recross the strips of moon-blanched green. Come, shepherd, and again renew the quest. Here, where the reaper was at work of late, in this high field's dark corner, where he leaves his coat, his basket, and his earthen cruse, and in the sun all morning binds the sheaves, then here at noon comes back his stores to use. Here will I sit and wait, while to my ear from uplands far away the bleating of the folded flocks is borne, with distant cries of reapers in the corn, all the live murmur of a summer's day. Screened in this nook, o'er the high, half-reaped field, and here till sundown, shepherd, will I be. Through the thick corn the scarlet poppies peep, and round green shoots and yellowing stalks I see pale pink convolvulus in tendrils creep, and air-swept lindens yield their scent, and rustle down their perfumed showers of bloom on the bent grass where I am laid, and bower me from the August sun with shade, and the eye travels down to Oxford's towers. And near me on the grass lies Glanville's book. Come, let me read the oft-read tale again, the story of that Oxford scholar poor, of pregnant parts and quick inventive brain, who, tired of knocking at preferment's door, one summer morn forsook his friends and went to learn the gypsy law and roamed the world with that wild brotherhood and came, as most men deemed, to little good but came to Oxford and his friends no more. But once, years after, in the country lanes, two scholars whom at college erst he knew met him and of his way of life inquired, whereat he answered that the gypsy crew, his mates, had arts to rule as they desired the workings of men's brains and they can bind them to what thoughts they will. And I, he said, the secrets of their art, when fully learned, will to the world impart. But it needs heaven-sent moments for this skill. This said he left them, and returned no more. But rumours hung about the countryside, that the lost scholar long was seen to stray, seen by rare glimpses, pensive and tongue-tied, in hat of antique shade and cloak of grey, the same the gypsies were, wore. Shepherds had met him on the hearst in spring, at some lone alehouse in the Berkshire Moors, on the warm ingle bench, the smock-frocked boors had found him seated at their entering. But mid their drink and clatter he would fly. And I myself seem half to know thy looks, and put the shepherd's wanderer on thy trace. And 
boys who in lone wheat fields scare the rooks, I ask if thou hast passed their quiet place. Or in my boat I lie moored to the cool bank in the summer heats, mid-wide grass meadows which the sunshine fills, and watch the warm green muffled Cumna hills, and wonder if thou hauntest thy shy retreats. For most I know thou lovest retired ground, Thee at the ferry Oxford riders blithe, returning home on summer nights have met, crossing the stripling Thames at Bablock Hythe, trailing in the cool stream thy fingers wet, as the punt's rope chops round, and leaning backwards in a pensive dream, and fostering in thy lap a heap of flowers, plucked in, the, in shy fields and distant witchwood bowers, and thine eyes resting on the moonlit stream. And then they land, and thou art seen no more. Maidens who from the distant hamlets come to dance around the Fifield elm in May, oft through the darkening fields have seen thee roam, or cross a stile into the public way. Oft thou hast given them store of flowers, the frail leafed white anemone, dark bluebells drenched with dews of summer eaves, and purple orchises with spotted leaves. But none hath words she can report of thee. And above Godstow Bridge, when hay time's here, in June, and many a scythe in sunshine flames, men who through those wide fields of breezy grass, where black-winged swallows haunt the glittering Thames, to bathe in the abandoned Lasher Pass, have often passed thee near, sitting upon the river bank or grown, Marked thine outlandish garb, thy figure spare, thy dark, vague eyes and soft, abstracted air. But when they come from bathing, thou wast gone. At some lone homestead in the Cumna Hills, where at her door, open door, the housewife dons, thou hast been seen or hanging on a gate to watch the threshers in the mossy barns. Children who early range these slopes and late for cresses from the hill rills have known thee eyeing all an April day the springing pastures and the feeding kind and mark thee when the stars come out and shine through the long dewy grass move slow away. In autumn, on the skirts of Bagley Wood, where most the gypsies by the turf-edged way pitch their smoked tents, and every bush you see with scarlet patches tagged and shreds of grey above the forest ground called Thessaly, the blackbird picking food sees thee, nor stops his meal, nor fears at all. So often has he known thee, past him stray, wrapped, twirling in thy hand a withered spray, and waiting for the spark from heaven to fall. <clears throat> and once in winter, on the causeway chill, where home through flooded fields foot travellers go, have I not passed thee on the wooden bridge, wrapped in thy cloak and battling with the snow, thy face towards Hinksy and its wintry edge? And thou hast cl climbed the hill and gained the white brow of the Cumna range, turned once to watch while thick the snow flakes fall, 
the lines of festal light in Christchurch Hall, then sought thy straw in some sequestered grange. But what, I dream, two hundred years are flown since first thy story ran through Oxford halls, and the grave Glanville did this tale inscribe, that thou wert wandered from the studious walls to learn strange arts and join a gypsy tribe. And thou from earth art gone long since, and in some quiet churchyard laid, some country nook where o'er thy unknown grave tall grasses and white flowering nettles wave under a dark red-fruited yew tree's shade. No, no, thou hast not felt the lapse of hours, for what wears out the life of mortal men? Tis that from change to change their being rolls. Tis that repeated shocks again, again, exhaust the energy of stronger souls and numb the elastic powers till having used our nerves with bliss and teen and tired upon a thousand schemes our wit to the just pausing genius we remit our well-worn life and are what we have been. Thou hast not lived, why shouldst thou perish so? Thou hadst one aim, one business, one desire, else wert thou long since numbered with the dead, else hadst thou spent, like other men, thy fire. The generations of thy peers are fled, and we ourselves shall go. But thou possessed an immortal lot, and we imagine thee exempt from age. And living on, thou livest on Glanville's page, because thou hadst what we, alas, have not. For early didst thou leave the world, with powers fresh, undiverted to the world without, firm to their mark, not spent on other things, free from the sick fatigue, the languid doubt, which much to have tried is much been in much been baffled, brings a life unlike to ours, who fluctuate idly without term or scope, of whom each strives nor knows for what he strives, and each half lives a hundred different lives, who wait like thee, but not like thee in hope, Thou waitest for the spark from heaven, and we liked half-believers of our casual creeds, who never deeply felt nor clearly willed, whose insight never has borne fruit in deeds, whose vague resolves never have been fulfilled, for whom each year we see breeds new beginnings, disappointments new, who hesitate and falter life away, and lose tomorrow the ground won today. Ah, do not we, wanderer, wear it, await it too? Yes, we await it, but it still delays, and then we suffer. And amongst us one, who most has suffered, takes dejectedly his seat upon the intellectual throne, and all his store of sad experience he lays bare of wretched days, tells us his misery's birth and growth and signs, and how the dying spark of hope was fed, and how
how the breast was soothed and how the head and all his hourly varied anodynes. This for our wisest, and we others pine and wish the long unhappy dream would end and waive all claim to bliss and try to bear with close-lipped patience for our only friend, sad patience, too near neighbour to despair. But none has hope like thine. Thou, through the fields and through the wood dost stray, roaming the countryside, a truant boy, nursing thy project in unclouded joy, and every doubt long blown by time away. O oh, born in days when wits were fresh and clear, and life ran gaily as the sparkling Thames, before this strange disease of modern life, with its sick hurry, its divided aims, its heads or taxed, its palsied hearts was rife. Fly hence our contact fear. Still fly, plunge deeper in the bowering wood, averse as Dido did with gesture stern from her false friend's approach in Hades turn. Wave us away and keep thy solitude. Still nursing the unconquerable hope, still clutching the inviolable shade, with a free onward impulse, brushing through by night the silver branches of the glade. Far on the forest skirts where none pursue, on some mild pastoral slope emerge, and resting on the moonlit pales, freshen thy flowers as in former years, with dew, or listen with enchanted ears from the dark dingles to the nightingales. But fly our paths, our feverish contact, fly, for strong the infections of our mental strife, which Though it gives no bliss, yet spoils for rest. And we should win thee from thy own fair life, Like us distracted, and like us unblessed. Soon, soon thy cheer would die, Thy hopes grow timorous and unfix thy powers, And thy clear aims be cross and shifting made, and then thy glad perennial youth would fade, fade and grow old at last and die like ours. Then fly our greetings, fly our speech and smiles. As some grave Tyrian trader from the sea descried at sunrise an emerging prow lifting the cool-haired creepers stealthily, stealthily, the fringes of a southward-facing brow among the Aegean Isles, and saw the merry Grecian coaster come, freighted with amber grapes and Chilean wine, green bursting figs and tunnies steeped in brine, and knew the intruders on his ancient home. The young, light-hearted masters of the waves, and snatched his rudder, and shook out more sail, and day and night held on indignantly o'er the blue midland waters with the gale, betwixt the Syries and soft Sicily to where the Atlantic raves outside the western straits and unbent sails there where down cloudy cliffs through sheets of foam shy traffickers the dark Iberians come 
and on the beach undid his corded bales.